the reason you'll do a step splice on thermoplastic, as Dan points out, strength, a step splice is stronger than a finger splice is because you got more surface contact area. Second reason is if you're going to do a splice in the field and you can't get a press in there because there's no room for it, and, and there are several applications where it's just impossible yeah. to do that, they'll do a step splice so that they can put a uh, plastic adhesive on it, clamp it down, let it sit overnight, and come back in and do it that way. And those are the two most logical places you'll find them. And the reason why you do a bias splice is also so that you can go over a smaller pulley Smaller guy. pulleys, yeah. And yeah. you can reduce, you can use a, a belt that otherwise you couldn't use by using a bias splice. It gives you a stronger belt because you don't have that moment of time. And there is a moment of time on a straight 90 degree splice where you don't have the ability to carry all the tension. You've spread out that tension on the bias. You have. You know what we mean by that? On, on the bias? Yes. Yeah, it's like a 20 degree angle. That, about like that. A 20 degree angle or a bias. Across the belt. Across the belt. So consequently, you've got good belt pull pulling non splice belt all the way through. You've got full strength, essentially, except for that little moment of time, as opposed to having the full width moment of time where you've got a straight 90 degree splice. Have we made that clear? Good. Um, skiving is skiving. Skive is to cut at a, an angle, the end of the belt, and then place the two ends together, making sure that you maintain a uniformity of thickness. And again, that's a 90 degree, but it can be done. I, I've done it on a bias as well. So bias can be done either way too. Can be done on the thermoplastic or the thermoset. The, the truth is that a, a sky splice has been around for several hundred years. Yes. Uh, it was used for leather belt uh, forever, and it's still used for leather belt. That is just about the only way that they can effectively do it and do it well. The other thing is nylon core belt is always done that way. Right. So skiving right. is, is a very typical thing. Uh, it, it's a very customary thing. It's also a good way to do it. it it's it's very, uh, very reasonable that somebody would want to do a sky splice. Finger splices. A finger splice is simply cutting fingers in the belt. It's going to be used, it can be used on a thermoset belt too with urethane. That, that's one exception of a finger splice on a thermal set. You can use a urethane and put fingers together and drop urethane, melt urethane in, in the splice itself. Uh, but a finger splice is you're cutting the fingers and you're placing the fingers together. Again, squaring the ends of the belt, finding the center line, cutting the fingers and placing the fingers together. Most of the time you're tacking them in place so they don't move. You attack them and then you place them into the press, heat it, adding your film if necessary, and you come up with a splice and a lot of times you can't even tell there's a splice unless you look at the back side of the belt. And again, it, it's strong because the width of the finger is also pulling the material through and then the leading edge of that finger is also then starting to pull the rest of the belt through. You don't have a wide moment of time where there's a straight um, demarcation of the, the tensile strength of the belt. There's a second type of the finger over finger. That's where there's two layers of fingers placed together. It's more difficult to do unless you have some of the, the newer tools to do it. But there are some good tools today to put together the finger over finger. That's a two 
mechanical fasteners started off uh, about 110 years ago in two forms. One was uh, a metal lace and it was stamped out of metal and it has teeth on it and you can basically hammer it in place. So it, it does come in a lot of different sizes. This is the number seven. There's a whole series of numbers. Uh, basically, they're designed to go certain thicknesses of belt and certain minimum pulley diameters. And those are not any particularly more difficult than that. You have steels and you have stainless steels. And in stainless steels, you can have a couple of different grades. You can have a 400 series, uh, which has no nickel in it. Uh, and you can also have a 300 series, which does have nickel in it, and it will give you certain non-magnetic characteristics. Uh, for the 300 series, you would typically use uh, where you may have meat and that type of thing. Other ones uh, that you could get away with 400 series, uh, that may be just for wash down consideration, or maybe you don't want it to get rusty uh, in use outside or something like that. Because if it's just carbon steel, it is going to rust. I mean, it's just going to rust. But some of it gets fairly small. Uh, and sometimes uh, some of the belt we'll be looking at tomorrow uh, actually is better laced with this type of metal lacing that's stamped uh, rather than the wire hook because uh, stuff like uh, uh, your Teflon coated fabrics and some of your thin silicone belts, uh, they do not like to get wire hooks in them because they tend to comb through. Uh, the other type of product that was introduced about 105 or so years ago was a wire hook. Now, wire hooks are not made the way they're made today, and they're not made out of the same kind of metal that they were made 100 years ago either. Uh, an advantage of a wire hook is that uh, you get a nice staggered pattern. Uh, you, you can use a lot of different metal forms. Uh, a disadvantage is that it requires some tooling uh, to install. Uh, sometimes this tooling can be several thousand dollars, uh, versus somebody with a light 10-ounce uh, uh, hammer or something. So there, there is a, a little bit more precision with a wire hook. Uh, it can uh, do a lot of different things for you. Uh, this is a carded style hook, which means that each hook is individual. And as they're individual hooks, uh, you get nice troughability. Uh, it, it'll do a lot of things like that. Uh, you can make these really quite small to go over pulleys down around three quarters of an inch. Uh, and for those people who aren't familiar with Imperial, uh, you can just multiply that times a fraction and you get just a few millimeters. So th those, are, uh, those are quite thin. Uh, this is the exact same hook size that I had as a carded hook, but this hook has a metal wire and this metal wire holds these individual hooks together. And with this, you simply just remove this piece of protective strip, and then you can put this into your tool and put your lacing in, and then you can close it in a similar fashion. Uh, this one can be used for troughing belts as well, so that still do the same thing. Your common bar lace, uh, uh, it doesn't do particularly well on on, uh, on troughing type applications. These typically like to be run flat. So, uh, so those are your two basic types of hook type fasteners. The other type fasteners that we have are really compression type fasteners. Uh, the hook type fasteners, common bar, a wire hook, they really rely on something to grab into the belt and the belt has to have enough weft integrated with its warp and enough structure so that it doesn't comb through. Uh, if you have combing through, the belt fabric is not strong enough. If you have the hook opening up, the hook is not strong enough for the belt. So only two particular modes of failure. <laughs> kind of simple. So you've got a belt that's too weak and so you need a stronger belt if you're going to use that style. 
if it opens up, you need a different size lace so that you get more reach back. We have uh, an application where uh, we, we built custom lacing machines for a, a company that makes belts and uh, they do 300 belts a day uh, using this style lace and it's a perfect application for them because of their type of belt and the application. Uh, to do 300 belts a day is a lot of belts. But this is very quick, very easy, very simple. Yes? What kind of lace is that that you have in this game? Is that a name bar lace? Or no, this, this, this is what's called common bar. I'm staying away from brand names. So this is common bar. This is wire hook. This is a welded wire hook here. This is a welded wire hook here. This is a carded hook here. Uh, in, in the compression style fasteners uh, for light duty, uh, you go basically a sixteenth of an inch. A sixty-two is point oh six two. That's one sixteenth of an inch. Uh, if we do one twenty-five, that's point one two five. That's an eighth of an inch. And a one eighty-seven is three sixteenths. Uh, not a lot of magic to those numbers. So this has a range. It'll go uh, up to about three thirty seconds. The one twenty-five picks up to about one thirty seconds. Goes over to about 3 16 187 picks up and goes up to not not a full quarter but so each one has a range but you get outside that range they don't work you get your staples too long they won't set they won't set it's just too much too much however there are ways to solve those problems and that is that um, uh, you actually have two different ways this product comes one is without the staples pre-inserted, and so the other is the way they are pre-inserted. Uh, with this style of lacing, you can deviate from your standard thicknesses if you have very short uh, reach back requirements because you need to go over small pulleys, but your belt is a little thicker. You can actually use a 125 staple in this lacing where this comes pre-mounted and you couldn't actually do it. It never would work. The same token, you could use uh, a smaller staple if you had a much thinner belt, but you wanted more reach back and your pulleys would accommodate that. So you could take a 125 lace, put a 62 staple in, or a 187 staple in a 125 if it was a little thicker. So you can, you can mix and match that uh, and, and it can be a very effective way to solve problems. So it, it really will solve problems. Uh, now, when we talk about uh, belt thicknesses, we really are not necessarily talking about the total thickness, but we're talking about the thickness that you will actually lace. And so uh, this is a, a very sophisticated 2011 model of a Skyver. It can use by hand, it doesn't require electricity or air, and, and you, can, you can do rough top belting very easily. Uh, and when you do, then you measure the net thickness, and that is the thickness that you want to work with. You never want to take rough top belting in any case and try to lace into the rough top belting because it will just lever out. It will just lever out, and let me tell you what, it will do it quickly. So a few revolutions, and you can go back and relace that belt. This time, take a skiver and do this. So but don't okay. take it down to the ply. Don't take it down to the ply. You don't grind belt. You buff it. You don't cut down to the fabric. As soon as you cut down to the fabric, uh, you've immediately reduced the effectiveness of that top ply where you are and it's rendered no strength, no strength at all. So very dangerous, very dangerous practice to do that. We do go up to about 150 pounds. So I know most of the samples you saw this morning weren't quite this thick that we, you would use this, but actually this is another type of compression fastener that uses rivets. And actually there are rivets that are small enough 
you guys see this? It's, you, it, this is small enough. So uh, there are applications where cold feeder belts, uh, you take a two ply 220, you take the top and bottom cover off, what do you got left? About an eighth of an inch. And so you need a relatively short rivet for that. And this is what you use. Uh, so, uh, so rivets can be made quite short uh, so that they will effectively close down and set. Because if you use a rivet that's too long, it will not set and it will be standing up on the top and you can put your finger all around the head and it's no, it's not compressing, it's not compressing, it's no longer effective and it will comb right through the belt. Longer if if we're supplying a staple type lace, uh, it's going to be uh, about an inch in from the total. So a 36 inch belt is going to have a piece of lace of about 35. So your pin is going to be about 35 inches. And so it's going to be inset just a little bit. That's the standard way to do that. With wire hook type lacing and with common bar uh, lacing, these are supplied full length. These are supplied in 10, 24s or custom links. Uh, but, but common bars are always the nominal 36 inch, 48 inch, whatever, and you break off whatever hooks you want to to accommodate that. Yes? Bending the pin, an okay way to keep it from drifting? Yeah, uh, it is. Uh, you, you don't need to do a lot, uh, but just a simple little 90 degree bend. Uh, we supply uh, retainer washers. Uh, standard part of the package with all of our uh, staple type lace and with our rivet fasteners we have a couple of different types of retainers that we use on those uh, so that they do that uh, if you the first thing you need to know is uh, he asked okay we want to bend the pen why do you want to bend the pen the pen walks out why does the pen walk out it's two reasons Anybody know a reason? Vibration. If this belt's not tight enough, it's going to walk out. Well, if, if you don't have enough dry. tension on a belt, if you don't have enough tension on a belt, it might walk out. Or something in the system is crooked and is causing it to walk. So those are the 99% case. People do make mistakes and they lace belts crooked, but you seldom, if ever, do that, so I didn't want to mention it. <laughs> but, but the tension and the system are the two major causes. Most people are pretty conscientious about lacing them straight. So, so if you have low tension, bring up your tension a little bit uh, it, and she'll track really nice for you and your pen won't walk. Have a systems problem, you're going to have a big problem with your belt in general. So you need to get that straight first. So if your pin is walking, tr don't just address the pin, try to address the root cause. If you can get to the root cause, you'll eliminate your pin issue. Most pins are, are available uh, in either notched form so that the corrugations will match either the hooks or the common bar lacing, or we also provide a lot of pins with uh, coatings a typically nylon, a bearing grade nylon, grade six nylon. So the lacing bites into it, and as it bites into it with a little tension, it, it, it doesn't come out, and you don't need to bend them. The reverse of that, when you're removing a pen that's been worn in for a while, <laughs> any tricks to... Turn it 90 degrees, you mm -hmm. take a pair of uh, electrician pliers, grab hold of it, turn it 90 degrees, and withdraw. Is it fair to it say, could, I would always ship the belt could be bent. with the pin in, laced. And the reason I would do that is so that when the customer got it, he knew that you could indeed get the pin in. Because a lot of times they get those belts, the pin's not in there, they fight it, they say it's crooked, this isn't that, it's not flat. I always like to ship the belt laced with the pin in it. You that, should be able to pull that out easy. That way that it was kind of confirming the fact that yes, you can get the pin in. It's, it shouldn't be a problem. But y you lace it straight and it'll go in, it'll come out. So yeah, you shouldn't have that much trouble pulling pins. We pull pins on high tension belts that you've never dreamt of those tensions. So 1500 PIW belts, pull the pins all the time.
every day. Every day. Are you talking about used belts that may have been on there a year? Or are you talking about new belts pulling it no, out? No, I'm talking about belts that get major usage. At some point, yeah, you, you're going you're gonna to chew it up. There's nothing wrong. As a matter of fact, there's, there's everything right. If it's been on there a year, there's everything right about taking about six inches or a foot off of each end and relacing that belt because now you've got something nice and fresh. You're going to put it back on the system. You want it to run another year. If you just put something back in there, you may pull it off in another week because it, it is fatigued. And it's going to be fatigued in those first few inches. And that's where it's going to be fatigued the most. That's why whenever you do splicing, you want to get back into some fresh fabric, yeah. fresh material, so that you've got something that you can work with. So if it's been on there a year or so, thank you. You've gotten good <coughs> use out of it. Strip it out, pull it together. If you don't have enough take up, probably if they didn't have enough take up, uh, it's already stretched enough that you can, you can do that again. Yeah. That's what I was going to say. Pay attention to the amount of take up you have in the system and use that accordingly. Good time to get the, the uh, uh, splice put in a proper place on the system. If you look at a lot of belts that have 90 degree square splices mechanically, the outsides take the most abuse. And when you have, tr when you have troughings, uh, conveyor belt going to flat, you have something called a transition. Uh, transitions on light duty, heavy duty, are equally important. Uh, I won't get the math correct, but just trust me for a minute. Did you want to say something? No, I was going to see if you're right. You give the right number. Okay. Uh, let's let's say I've got a thousand PIW belt traveling 800 feet a minute, and uh, it, it's 60 inches wide. Uh, when it's when it goes, if you have no transition and you've got idlers every five feet, and so you go five feet to your head in five feet, and you're going 800 feet a minute, that belt, instead of going 800 feet a minute in the center line on the outside, it needs to go about, let's say, 1,260 feet a minute. Mm -hmm. Well, it can't do it. It can't do it. So what happens? You, you get slack in the center of the belt, you get extremely high tension on the outside of the belt, and you get edge deterioration. Now, all I really need to do is take two pencils <coughs> here. These aren't pencils, these are pens. But if you just take two of them, and if you have one at an angle and one straight, obviously this one's a lot shorter, but they're the same length. So if I could stretch this one out a bit so that it's equal out to here, it would be a lot longer, correct? It would be about, oh, maybe about 30% longer. Uh, so transitions are very important. So if you go from uh, uh, 35 degree troughing down to 20, down to 15, down to zero, uh, and you do the mathematics, you'll end up close to zero. Yeah. And so the, the rule distance? on troughing idlers is you have them every, say, five feet, and your turns on ten. Uh, so every five feet, you've got an idler. And so you go from 35 down to 20, down to 15, down to 10, down to zero at your head pulley. Uh, transition can also mean not just about troughing and coming out of the trough and laying flat to go around a pulley, but also in a tangential drive where the belt is twisting for some reason, and then coming back around and then wrapping flat. That's another form of transition. But basically it has to do with the belt at some, at some point being uh, turned or cupped or twisted, and then flattening back out to go around a flat pulley. Like the longer those, like exactly that. right, like a tube winder. The longer the transition, the better. Okay, mechanical fasteners, kind of done. I spend all year on it. Uh, plastic fasteners. Uh, plastic fasteners come in several different ways. Uh, this one is particularly talking about some kind of uh, uh, rivet. It's a plastic rivet. Uh, maybe it looks a little bit like a one-two-five uh, fastener. 
uh, but it's made out of thick plastic that's molded and you punch holes in there and then you have to spin them or, or ultrasonically weld them or something in order to hold those down. Uh, fairly low tensile applications uh, uh, use where you've got to have some kind of metal detector, not magnetic detector, but metal detector. Uh, plastic spiral lace uh, is another way to do this. Everybody familiar with plastic spiral lace? How many of us professionals <laughs> like plastic spiral lace here in this room? <laughs> Raise your hand. What do you mean like? Uh, it, it's really very it's common very in, the, in the uh, paper making industry. It's, it's really where it no, came it's from right. uh, for doing dryer it's felts and right. things like this. And yeah. only in the last 30 years or so uh, has it been introduced yeah. for light duty conveyor belt. But uh, so, yeah, here's where you are always going to use your ply splitter. And so you'll always use that. And it comes in single plies and two plies and, and some other variations. And you also use uh, plastic pencil pens when you do this as well. Uh, and you, here you do like to use leaders where you, where you have wider belts. A lot of these are fairly narrow. Uh, and there's actually a model of this type of spiral lace now it doesn't even require to have a pen. It's just like a zipper. Fabric reinforced. Uh, this is actually where uh, someone has taken a belting type material. The most common applications I can think of are for rough top belting. Uh, this is where I see it used the most. And it's, it's actually a fabric splice. You, you vulcanize it uh, into your belt uh, on the end and now you have a rough top splice uh, that's fully covered and you just put a pen in, typically a metal pen or a plastic type pen. Would be kind of like a hidden lace? Like a hidden lace, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, contamination in a splice is a, critical. I mean, if you have any contamination, any, any r remnants of any foreign material in that splice, you've got a bad splice. So the, the key thing is it, it can be done vulcanized, but many times a mechanical after a, a, a vulcanized splice is, is the only option that makes any sense. Uh, sometimes uh, you, you need to take, uh, in, a, in a meat plant, uh, you've got to take that belt off every night and you've got to wash down. Yeah. Every yeah. night. They have to soak them in some cases. Yeah. So, so what you're going to use is a 300 series stainless steel mechanical fastener. You take the pen. What do you do with the pen? Throw it away. You want to throw that sucker away, start off with a new pen the next day. You know, sell people extra pens. It's the cheapest thing there. It's the one thing that's going to get them in trouble. You know, it's the one thing you're going to get them in trouble. You're going to put three new tires on a car and not change out the fourth one? You're going to do the front brakes, but not the back brakes? It, it, it's really not about money. It can be, but, but that's not really, you should, you should always work toward, and I, I started off this morning by saying, you really want to do the right thing first. So don't place money first. Try to do the right thing first. And the money will take care of itself. Because the vulcanized splice may be much cheaper over the life or the mechanical splice may be much cheaper day to day. So, yeah. One of, one of the things you have to keep in mind, as we mentioned this morning, is that there are fewer maintenance people that know what they're doing. You may be better off going in and doing a mechanical splice for them because they don't do it every day or they don't have the tools to do it properly. And that's, that's one of the things that it's an opportunity for a distributor to make money is to go out and, and do the uh, mechanical splice or vulcanized splice, whatever is best for that customer. Yeah, a lot of times uh, belt shops don't think about doing mechanical services in the field. Sure. But you should. Yeah, but. You know, why not? I mean, you're the pros. You can go in and you can earn a good buck doing that because you're in and out quick. You don't have to take a whole lot of equipment. You don't need a lot of power supplies, all this other stuff. You can get in and out quick. So, you know, everybody doesn't agree, it, but 
Yeah. yeah. Two, in, in the plants, I mean, if you can't put a belt on endless, you have three options. You can melt it, you can glue it, or you can lace it. Of those three, glue it. lacing is by far quicker. <laughs> Gluing can take he's an Elmer's man. Eight, ten, twenty-four hours to set. Yeah. Uh, uh, vulcanizing, uh, melting it, can take again hours. Couple, yeah, hours the, the, at the minimum, if you're ready to go. So if you got to run and it's not sensitive to having the application isn't sensitive to having lace in the application. You're going to have a belt ready to go. Uh, you're going to pull a pin, push a pin in, and keep running. Yeah. yeah so, so yeah, it, don't don't think of it as simply as a dollars and cents point of view because it, it can really and truly be far more cost effective, or to do a vulcanized splice over time if it fits the application. So make the application work for you. Don't try to get the old square plug in the round hole. It doesn't work. So presses, uh, most of these presses for uh, thermoplastic are not high temperature, they're not real wide like rubber presses that get really huge platens and, and a lot of control things, uh, they're, they're somewhat more simpler. Uh, most of them are clamshells, right? Most of them are clamshells? No? For what kind of belt? Thermo thermoplastic. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Some are clamshell, but others are top and bottom platens. Yeah, okay. Yeah. But, but they're narrow platens. But narrow platens. Yes. 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 Not yes. sectional presses like Not you sectional know, presses. for black right. 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 About a 10 inch or yeah. less. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so right. Five, seven, ten. Yeah. Ten. And, and you don't have a press for every width, but you operate within reason, and you also can use belt shims accommodate that, correct? Yeah. Yeah. So, so. okay. Well, you tell them splitters. To, to get a, your new Everybody familiar stuff. with splitters? It's a neat tool. It's a neat tool. Uh, cleating machines, you really need to be talking to the belt manufacturer and the cleating supplier to make sure that what you're doing is compatible. So the compatibility of product is very, very important. But the machines themselves, a lot of them are traveling gun. Is this still more or less the most popular? Yeah, the heat gun. We've seen a lot of combination machines, cleat, feed guide, and all that kind of stuff. People buy them to save space on the floor. I don't particularly care for it. But what, what time? I'm sorry. I'm cleat, uh, cleat machines, y you know, that are uh, with the wheels and the hot air, the leaster gun, and yeah. it rolls along. Then you turn the head, and you can put a V guide down with it too. Depends on the tool. Yeah. Yeah. Depends on the tool. I mean, yeah. you you have some that are very good. Yes. Okay. okay. Uh, so these, it would be difficult for me to talk about all the different variations of cleating machines because I I don't know how many models and how many different people make them but there are a lot of different ones. So I, I would suggest what you do is when you're looking at new equipment, evaluate, talk to other people, talk to people that they have sold those machines to in the past and, and make sure that you feel comfortable that it's gonna do the kind of work that you do. Guide applicators is the same thing. It, it, the techniques are similar but different. They're using heat or pressure and uh, temperature to do those. Lasers, uh, I, I mentioned lasers only briefly, uh, but with common bar lacing, there are tools that are made uh, that, that you can put in common bar lacing uh, in it very, very precisely and very, very accurately and very, very quickly. And some of those machines are a combination that you can use to also put in uh, wire hooks of either style, uh, whether it's common bar or, or the carded. So here again, basically you want to be concerned about your width. When you select machines, I would say always try to select a machine that will do 90% of your work, at least 90% of your work. I mean, if 90% of your work is 48 inch and under, you don't necessarily need to buy a 60, uh, but the economics of buying a 60 is not that much greater than a 48 or even a 36. 
So I would always try to own equipment that does the widest thing so you don't have to index. Uh, fix knives. Keep your knife sharp. Use a good stone. You know, keep your tools sharp. Uh, you're doing rotary blades, send them out. <laughs> don't try to do them in-house. Uh, it's very difficult to do rotary blades in-house. Uh, so, uh, the, but there are a lot of different tools here to do that. Finger bunches, uh, basically you're going to use whatever rule dies required and you can't make something work that's not the right thing. So if the specifications call for a certain size finger, don't try to use something that you don't have. Buy the tool that you need, okay, buy the tool you need.